take your Bibles and open them to the third chapter of Habakkuk. We're going to finish this book today. We're skipping over all the things that he had to say in chapter 3. We'll touch on them after a while. But I want us to get to the end as we talk today about complain or rejoice. The choice is yours. And the reason for that is we start this book with complaints. Habakkuk is complaining about all of the sin and the evilness that's going on in society, wanting to know why God hasn't already done something about it and is he ever going to do anything about it. Then God told him what he was going to do, which led to another complaint that God was being too harsh on the people, but he ends up rejoicing. Now, nothing had changed in anything that God had said or anything that God was going to do. As a matter of fact, the things that God had said he was going to do had not even started taking place yet. But Habakkuk ended up rejoicing and praising God over what God said he was going to do, which had originally led to the complaint, the second complaint that Habakkuk had against God. Now next week, and I told you this last week, but next week we're going to start a study of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel follows Habakkuk. Habakkuk is the prophet that said, God is going to punish Judah. God is going to let the Babylonians utterly destroy Judah and take us into captivity because of our unfaithfulness to God. Ezekiel picks up as a prophet in Babylon and showing prophesying and showing the people that are in captivity what they need to do in order to be restored to the place that they were before God's judgment came upon them. So we'll do these two together and start Ezekiel next Sunday. Now this morning, we're going to look at this chapter. We are going to go to the last chapter of Job. And we are going to go to Isaiah chapter 6. This chapter, the last chapter of Job, and I'm not sure what number that is, uh, but it's the last chapter in Job. You won't have any trouble finding it. And Job is right before Psalms. So, the last chapter of Job, the sixth chapter of Isaiah, and right here. This applies to us because we've got a choice also of complaining or rejoicing. And the situations are really quite a bit better here than they were there. We talk about how bad things are here. They aren't as bad as they were there because God has not yet brought someone against us to punish us and discipline us for our sins. But we've got that choice. There are things that go on in your life, things that are not good, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that get it out of your... If you think it's not good, just pretend that it's good and you can rejoice. No, there are things that aren't good. Some of you have cancer, that's not good. Some of you have loved ones that's got cancer, that's not good. Some of you have lost loved ones, that's not good. 
Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you have had a financial setback. That's not good. And that's not going to be good. But what are you going to do about it? How are you going to handle the situation? Are you going to constantly complain because things aren't going the way you want them to go or think that they ought to go? Or will you be someone that learns to rejoice even in the midst of all the bad that is going on? So stand with me as I read, and you can follow along in your Bible or on the screen, beginning in verse 17 of Habakkuk 3. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the field yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high heels. Different than what women are wearing. I just caught that. <laughs> Father, as we come to you today, we thank you and praise you so much for what you're doing. Thank you, Father, that even in the midst of the storm, we can rejoice and praise you. And the choice is ours. But we will do what we choose to do, Maybe it might be to complain and just be drugged further and further down. Or maybe it would be to rejoice because we know that you are in control. I pray today that we choose to rejoice even in the storms of life, the failures of life. And that today we can learn how to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Wouldn't it be great to get to a place in your life that after that initial shock, that initial thing that comes over, over you, something bad has happened, you see something bad, you hear something bad, or it's happened to you or to one of your loved ones, that initial complaint, that initial sorrow, that somewhere in the midst of that, you could start to see the hand of God and you could start to rejoice even though the darkness may be all around and everyone else may be complaining, but you rejoice and you begin to praise God for what God is doing and the way God is going about doing it. This is what Isaiah did. This is what Job did. Just a little background on Job. Most of you know the story, but Satan asked God to be allowed to test Job. And God gave him permission to test Job. Also, God gave Satan permission to test Job. Peter, on the night that Jesus was arrested, Satan had been to God and asked permission, and God granted the permission. But God put a limit on what Satan could do. The limit with Job was, you can't take his life. But what Satan did do, Job was a wealthy man. He was a patriarch. He lived during the period of the patriarchs. Satan took everything that Job had, took every one of his animals, and he had tons of animals. He had seven, or seven, was it seven daughters and three sons, or three, seven daughters and three sons. He had seven daughters and three sons. 
He took their lives. Job ended up with boils all over his body. The only thing that Satan left Job was his wife that said, Job, just go and end it all. But in the end, and all of Job's friends were here. Job, you got, you're a sinner. Man, you're, you're a bad, 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 bad sinner. You need to repent and get it right with God so the blessing of God can come back upon you. And Job said, no, that's not it. That's not it. But they kept on. And in the end, even though Job lost everything, including his children, he ended up confessing something to God that is a key to us understanding whether we are going to complain or rejoice. Isaiah, the big city preacher, the prophet of Israel, to the kings of Israel, thought he was something until he had a vision of God. And then he realized something that we need to understand as well if we are going to decide whether to complain or rejoice in our lives. So let's go back to Habakkuk and look at that and see what's going on here. God had said because of all of the sin and unfaithfulness of the people of Judah that he was going to send the Babylonians to destroy them and take them into captivity. The temple would be destroyed, the walls of Jerusalem would be destroyed, all of it's going away and you're going into captivity because God's going to bring the Babylonians. And then Ezekiel complained about that, but God said, they're going to end up being defeated, but they are going to do what I told you first. So that's where we come down to this very end of it, where Habakkuk says, basically this is what he says, even though there's a great famine, there's no food to eat, even though all the animals are gone, and we have no meat to eat. Even though we are starving to death, yet I will rejoice in you, and I will praise you. If we get a hangnail, we're not in the very rejoicing and praising mood, are we? Habakkuk wasn't there in the beginning. Habakkuk was complaining in the beginning. He wasn't rejoicing. He wasn't praising God in the beginning. He was complaining. But something happened in these conversations that he was having with God because he would state his complaint. Then he would be quiet and God would answer him back. And then he would state his complaint and be quiet and God would answer him back. And it's in this complaining and God's answers that something clicked in Habakkuk and he said, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to praise God. The situation hadn't changed. The evil was still there. The unfaithfulness was still there. The Babylonians were still on their way. But something happened in the attitude of Habakkuk that went from complaining to rejoicing, and it happened quickly after God had spoken to him. So I want us to look at a few things this morning. How can you go from complaining to rejoicing? Well, if we look at Habakkuk, he had two complaints. One, God wasn't doing something, and the second complaint is, I don't want you to do what you're going to do. Do something, but don't do it. 
make it right, but don't make it right because I don't like, you know, I talked about the cough syrup. I don't like liquid medicine. Makes me throw up because I don't like it. And I could take it, but it's already up here that it's going to do that. But you look at it and you look at what Habakkuk is going on here with him and he's saying, I don't like your remedy to the problem. Do something different than what you're going to do. What happened with Habakkuk? What happened with Job? What happened with Isaiah that their attitudes changed toward God. First, they saw the power of God. Go to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And this is the vision that Isaiah had of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the king sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each with six wings. With two he covered his face, with uh, two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim threw, flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah, the great prophet to the kings, had a vision of God, and when he saw God as God is, he saw himself as he was. You know, I think that today the majority of Christians have, don't have a vision of God. Not a vision of God to where they have a true picture of themselves. I'm good. I'm the preacher. I'm the teacher. I'm the deacon. I'm the song leader, I'm the praise team, I'm the choir, I'm this, I'm that, and I'm all these things. But when we truly see God, we can't help but fall on our face before God. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm not holy. I'm not who I thought I was. And this is the problem with Habakkuk. It's a problem with Job. It's a problem with Mike Wells. And it's the problem with a lot of the rest of us as well. We're not really who we think we are when we see God. And we are compared to the holiness of Almighty God. This is what began to happen with Habakkuk. It's what began to happen with Job. Because Job will say, I have heard 
but now I see. Now I know. I don't only hear, but I know I see. I take it in. They saw, first of all, the holiness of God. God is right in everything he does. God is never wrong in anything. Understand this. Because there are a lot of things that happen in our lives that are bad. There are a lot of things that happen in our lives and we say, why God? Why would you let that happen to me? What have I done? Let me, let me tell you something. And I've said this before, but let me tell you. It is impossible Absolutely impossible for God to do less than the best for you because it would go against God's nature to do less than the best. So when that thing happens to me and I want to cry out and I want to say, why God, why are you letting this happen to me? Why are you letting this happen to my family? Why are you letting this happen to someone that I really care about. Why, God, why are you letting it happen? Then I got to remember that God is holy, God is righteous, and God is just. And God will never, ever allow anything less than the best to happen. <clears throat> I'm going to have a hard time accepting that, but it is the truth. And when I get to the point that I am able to look at a situation and I'm able to take that situation and I'm able to say, I don't know it, I don't understand it, I don't even like it, but I know that God loves me and God would never let anything happen to me that was less than the best. Amen. Now we say, well, how can it be best if someone gets cancer and dies? Let me tell you something, if they're a Christian, it can't get any better than that. Maybe not for us because we're going to miss someone, but not for them. Sometimes we say, well, I hope they get better. If they're a Christian, going to heaven's the ultimate healing. It's the ultimate better that they can have. So, he, they saw the holiness of God, but they also saw the power of God. God had the power to allow this to happen or bring it about to happen, the Babylonians, and then say, I'm going to let them punish you, but they are going to be punished for what they do. Now, if... We'll just go this way because... If my, I did something wrong when I was a boy and my grandmother said, I'm going to let your daddy whip you and then I'm going to whip your daddy for whipping you, I'm still going to get a whipping. <laughs> and it ain't going to make me feel a whole lot better that my daddy got whipped. But in essence, that's what God's saying. I'm going to let them punish you, then I'm going to punish them for punishing you. But Habakkuk got to the point because he knew that God was in control. You know what the ultimate outcome was going to be? They're going back home. The temple's going to get rebuilt. The walls of the city are going to be rebuilt. But they needed to get their lives right with God before that ever happened. And that's what God was doing with them. And if there are things going on in my life or around me, I may say, Lord, why? But I've got to understand that God is still in control. And if it is chastisement that God is trying to make me better, and I need to be faithful to him and walk through it 
and take it as God deals it out. But learn the lesson that God is trying to teach me. But it also may not be because of anything I've done. It may be because of something someone else has done and I'm just suffering the consequences of their sin. But Habakkuk was able to take that and see it and say, God wouldn't do anything that's not right. God is in complete control, so I'm going to trust God. And instead of complain about what's going on, I'm going to rejoice because I serve Almighty God. Another thing that they saw is that God didn't have it out for them. God loved them. And God loves you. God loves whoever it is. You know, there are some really, really, really bad people in this world. Really bad people in this world. They're more than really, really bad. They're a whole bunch of really bads. <laughs> but do you know what? God loves that person as much as he loves me, as much as he loves you. And you know what else? If that person, no matter how bad they are, no matter what they have done, or how many of those things they have done, if they will repent of their sin and by faith receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior, they're going to go to heaven just as quickly as I will or you will. Because Jesus died for them also. God loves you. And even if something happens that's not good, doesn't mean God doesn't love you. He still loves you more than anyone else could ever love you. And I think Habakkuk, Job, and Isaiah got to that point. Another lesson that was learned, we're going to have to go back to Job for. So go back to the last chapter of Job. Right before Psalms, chapter 42, started to say that, but I didn't want to be wrong. <laughs> so I was wrong by not saying it. Chapter 42 of Job. Now, Job has gone through all these things. He's lost all of his livestock. He's lost all of his children, lost everything Bent, have boils all over his body in pain and in agony, his wife fussing and complaining about everything, and his friends telling him, Job, you're a sinner, you need to get it right with God and make sure that everything's okay. All these things are going on with Job. And then, well, let's go back to chapter 38. Because Job will repeat this. Then the Lord answered Job. Now up until this time, his three friends and then Elihu have been talking to Job. Elihu was good, but the others were not. And then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now, I prepare, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth from the womb. And you can just go on. Chap or verse 34. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings 
that they may go and say to you, here we are, go over to the next chapter. Will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed by your manger? And you can just go on and on all the way through chapter 41, God questioning Job. Job, you're so smart that you can question me and you can doubt me and you can wonder why these things are happening. Job, since you're so smart, you answer these questions. Now here in chapter 42, Job is finally speaking to God. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Now listen, therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. You know what Job's saying? He's saying, Lord, I'm dumb and stupid because I questioned you. Lord, I had no idea what I was talking about. Now, listen. Verse 4. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Lord, I've seen you. I am nothing. Go back to Isaiah. I am a man of unclean lips. I am unworthy. Job, Lord, now that you've talked to me, now that you've questioned me, I've questioned you and acted like I knew what was going on and what, how to handle situations that are going on in the world today and around me, but you answered back, and now I know I know nothing. I know nothing other than what God lets me know. So I should know to put my total faith and my confidence in God. Now when Job finally saw this, and Job finally confessed to God that he was nothing compared to God, and knew nothing compared to God. God doubled all of his livestock. God gave him seven more daughters that were the most beautiful women in the land and three more sons. Seven sons and three daughters. The other way sounds better. <laughs> from my standpoint, but from you women, maybe not. Uh, seven sons and three daughters. God blessed him. But Job, like Habakkuk, like Isaiah, had to see the power of God, the holiness of God, the love of God, and that finally God is never going to desert you. I think maybe one of the problems we have when it comes to, if I go to the doctor and the doctor says cancer. I went to the doctor last year, at the beginning of last year, and I was told, you got a pretty bad problem with your heart. You need to go to a cardiologist. I said to the doctor, I go on Medicare the 1st of July, can it wait so I can afford to go? And they said, wait. So I made an appointment, and I went. And I went to the cardiologist. The cardiologist looked at the EKG, 
and said, you're worse off than you thought you were. <laughs> I had one foot in the grave, trying to get it out, but trying not to let on. Not doing anything because I just knew if I did anything, I was going to blow it and just go right then. So then I went and I had a stress test. I went for the results of it. You've had at least one and probably several other heart attacks in the past. And things aren't looking good. So I went for a chemical contrast MRI that does a lot of stuff and they can do 360 views and all that. Went and had that done, went to the doctor. Hmm, there's nothing wrong with you. But listen, no calcium, no plaque, no heart attacks, nothing. God is in control, but there it still could have been. Would God have loved me any less if all those things had have been true? No. Would God have deserted me? No, I would have probably been looking for God more in that situation than I would in this situation now. Now I'm healthy. I don't need God. Isn't that what we do? God will never forsake you. And sometimes it's when we are in those situations that we are looking a whole lot more toward God and we see God much clearer when we're going through those situations. I had a woman, I mentioned this before, but I had a woman, she wasn't a member of our church, she wasn't saved. She was the grandmother of a member of our church that we were serving at, not the last one, one before that. And her granddaughter came to me and said, my grandmother is dying of cancer and she's not saved. Would you go talk to her? So I went, she was in bed in her bedroom, couldn't get up at that time, and we sat there and we talked. And I can't remember her name, but we talked and I said, how do you feel about this? And this is one of the things that really stands out and it taught me a great lesson. I said, how do you feel about this? And she looked at me and she said, you know there have been a lot of people come to see me and every single one of them tells me how I should be feeling, but you're the only person that's asked me how. I feel. And she said, I'm scared. I'm scared. And that opened up the door to where we could talk about Jesus. And she ended up accepting Jesus as her Lord and her Savior. And then when the time came, she had the grace of God to die with no fear, none whatsoever, just I'm going home to see my Jesus. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And no matter how dark it is around you, he's right there with you to guide you through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before, for me in the presence of my enemies. God's with you. And he's never, ever, ever going to forsake you. You've got a choice. You can complain or you can rejoice. It's where your eyes are. It's are they on God or are they on the circumstances around you? Some of you in here today have never repented of your sins and never invited Jesus to come into your life 
to be your Lord and your Savior. We are going to give you the opportunity to do that today because you can't even start on this journey until you invite Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. Then you need to come and you need to do that this morning. He will forgive you and he will save you if you are sincere and mean it with all of your heart. Some of you are here, maybe you've accepted Jesus, but you've never followed him in believer's baptism as Tim did this morning. You need to come and say, Pastor Mike, we are saved, or I am saved, but we want to follow the Lord in baptism. And we'll set that up so that that can happen. Maybe you're here and you're not a member of Brown Road, but you'd know you're a church member or somewhere else, you've accepted Jesus and followed him in believer's baptism, that this is where God wants you to worship and serve him at, then you need to come this morning as well. Father, as we come to you today, Lord God, I just praise you and pray, Father, that many will come to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Others will come to follow you in believers' baptism and still others coming, Father, to join the church by letter, by statement, whatever is necessary for them to do that and that you will get all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we stand and sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. You come. Someone. Uh, if the Holy Spirit speaking to you today, you need to come and join the church, or you need to come to profess faith in Jesus or follow him in believer's baptism, you need to step out right now and come on. Two more verses and it's over with. So you come today as we sing these last two verses. Okay, we praise God. We got a family that has come. Robin has come by statement that she has accepted Jesus, followed him in believer's baptism, and would like to become a member of the church. J.C., her husband, and Liam, her son, uh, J.C. has accepted Jesus but needs to follow him in baptism by immersion. So he is going to do that. Liam accepted Jesus this morning and is going to follow the Lord in believer's <laughs> baptism as well. So next Sunday morning, two weeks, two weeks. So uh, be praying for them and that everything will go well and that just praise God for what he's doing here at Brown Road and how he's using the church to reach people for him. So you come by and welcome them in to the fellowship here at Brown Road and I think Carol mentioned it, but I was supposed to make an announcement in new members and got my mind on another thing. If you're in the new members class, and if you weren't there today and you're a new member or thinking about it, you need to come next week. Uh, if you're not in the church directory, not had your picture made, Alvin and Joyce will be there at 9.05 next Sunday morning for you to get your picture made. So show up pretty and smiley <laughs> to get your pictures made. Uh, okay, uh, Bill, would you dismiss us in prayer?